I don't know why anybody want to be a crabber, though. The amount of time and energy spent on this, on this stuff, a person be, could donate it to trying to find a cure for cancer and probably won't even put that much time that it needed to be a successful grabber. I kid you not, because it's never ending. Where does it begin? About right here. Right here is where it all begins. Building crab pots. All right, when we first started crabbing, I'll go to the very beginning. We only had 25 crab pots. I was still in high school. And my dad, he still had a regular job on shore. So we took our only 25 crab pots, got a crab and fishing license. We took them out on the water. Well, because my job had to, since my dad had a job where he had to be at work at 8 o'clock in the morning, we kind of like left the pier 4 o'clock in the morning to go out to do 25 crab pots. And he had to hurry up, get the pots done, be back in, and go to work. So out of the 25 crab pots we had on the water, we would catch as high as like four bushel crabs, which was pretty good back in 1974. But we built a very good crab pot, homemade, all that. We didn't buy crab pots. We built it. Caught pretty good for us. So we kind of liked the crabbing and the fishing, so we went into building crab pots and got into the business of catching and selling crabs. How many years we've been crabbing? 74, this is 2011, 30 some years. It's a long time. And guess what? Doesn't make you a professional being in the business that long. You would think the crabs are right here in this spot, and you set crab pots in that spot, and make a fool out of you, it'd be nothing there. There was more crabs in 1995 than today. A hell of a lot more. Why is that? <laughs> Pollution. How can you clean up pollution? Huh. I wish I knew that answer. That's like, how in the hell are you going to stop it from raining? Because every day, every day it rains, you're going to have pollution. Because the amount of industry and the amount of homes and have been built around the watershed of any tributary, any piece of water, you have disrupted the filtration system that Mother Nature has provided in years ago. When you take grasslands and uh, uh, wetlands and you convert it over to asphalt or concrete or parking lot, you have disrupted the ecology of that water system. Well, the main, the sort of broad categories are farms. I mean, we talk about farms, you're talking about uh, cow manure, uh, chicken manure washing off of farms into streams that washes into the bay. Also just dirt that washes off farms and then clouds the bay. You've got um, cities, so that when they say that, they mean like storm sewers. It rains a lot, dirt and dog poop and everything else goes into the storm sewers and come out, it comes out into the bay. And then sewer systems, so you know the stuff that actually gets treated before it's put back in the rivers. Sewers used to be the biggest problem, but they're also in some ways the easiest to fix because there's one pipe. You fix what goes on in that one pipe and the cleaner water comes out. So sewers have really been tackled as a source. Stormwater and farms are the two things that really haven't been tackled as much um, because the, that requires a lot of little fixes in a lot of places and it's really expensive. I mean, think about um, if you're a farmer you know, fencing off part of your land so the cows can't get close to your stream. Well, that's expensive because then now you can't, your cows can't graze in this place where they used to. If you're a city, you think about, well, what if, we cover, what if we got rid of all the asphalt and parking lots and replaced it with gravel so the water filters down more naturally? Well, that's extremely expensive. And so you're asking people in those two cases to make sacrifices that are very expensive for a bay that often is very distant to them. I mean, think about farmers, and they, some of them, the Bay Watershed goes up to Pennsylvania. So if you're in the middle of Pennsylvania and somebody says, look, you've got to, you know, take this big cost in your farm because the Chesapeake Bay, 300 miles away, needs to be cleaner, you can see why that'd be sort of an unpopular idea. I think people have been predicting the, the death of the Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay watermen for a long time, and some of them still hang on, but 
certainly it's hard to for me when I look at it unless one of the one of the you know crabs rockfish oysters unless one of those really comes back it's hard for me to see how this becomes a very viable business for a long time because you know even in the glory days there were three different you know three different seasons three different legs of the stool that supported those guys and now oysters are, are just gone I don't see any hope the oyster coming back but the, when there was a lot of crabs and a lot of oysters and a lot of rockfish it was a real you could make money doing it and think about the guys that are doing it now so they've seen the collapse of the oyster. That was, you know, one third of their whole business. The collapse of the oyster. The rockfish um, went down a lot too, and the crab was the only thing that kept them going. And then it began to decline. So if you're still out there doing it now, you've gone through like you've it, it stopped making financial sense a long time ago, and you're sort of sticking with it just because you love doing it. And so you really have to admire people who are staying with it with the job, even though so much of it has changed for the worse. So when they want to build that other tunnel down there. These bridges restrict water flow and you can take that to the bank. The Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel has already restricted the water flow into the Chesapeake Bay. Literally. And according to the scientists, the crabs, female crabs lay their eggs and the Eggs are out in the ocean, and northeasters are supposed to blow the, the larvae, the crab larvae, into the bay. But the Bay Bridge Tunnel restricts a lot of that. This is just to show you that the Bay Bridge has restricted the wind flow right here. So, man, man is a problem. Where's your future lie? Where do you think your future is? Yeah, crabbing. How do you think, where are you going to be in 20 years for crabbing? If you were going to realistically think about what I'm asking you, in 20 years, you think you're going to be owning a boat and crabbing pots? Knowing what you just saw the other day, you worked 90 pots for how many crabs? Three dozen, you said. All right, you, that's, that's called an natural disaster, but let me say this to you. I already, I'm, I'll be in there next year. I know that. I know that, but I'm but just asking you to. I've seen myself in 20 years. Yes, I want your insight. I want to hear what your insight would be. I think if, uh, I think if things keep going the way it's going, I don't think we're going to be able to do this. I think for a lot of people around here, <clears throat> is this sort of eternal guilt trip. I think a lot of people that live in D.C., that are from the D.C. area or from Baltimore, is just like, oh, God, the Chesapeake Bay. It's always broken. It's always dirty. It always needs us to fix it. And I think people just have this, you know, there are some people that get to enjoy it and go fishing or sailing or whatever, but I think a lot of people just sort of feel like, oh, it's this horrible thing that, you know, I just feel so bad about and I can't fix. I was brought up pretty much on the bay in Baltimore County, uh, in Talbot County, and here on the eastern shore, lower eastern shore of Maryland and Somerset County. And the water quality I've seen just go away as a child. Back in the 90s, I did an interview for Farm Bureau. I made a comment that actually made the paper back then. That, uh, of course, my grandson was a lot younger, but I'm saying that you know, I was concerned about the bay, which I am. I, I think everyone should be concerned about the bay. But made a comment that I wanted to show my grandson a rockfish not a picture of one. You know, you can see five, six feet down at the end of the dock, right to the bottom. Today, I don't, you can't see your hand five inches under the water, only five or six feet. I think overall the farmers are trying to do the best job that they can and still, still make a living. You know, that's the other side of the coin, so. The company in Purdue or whoever, they own the chickens and they own the feed. The thing, the one thing they don't own is the poop. And so the, the farmers have to find, find a way of disposing of that. And so then you're talking about farmers that are running a very low margin business that have to deal with a really huge waste problem. And so people like Purdue have made some strides. For instance, there's a place on the eastern shore that takes, collects the chicken poop and compresses it together and makes it into fertilizer. States have tried to stick those big chicken companies with the cost of the manure, find a way of forcing them to spend money on regulating because obviously they have money to do it. But politically, it doesn't make a lot of sense because there's just three or four major chicken companies. And if they decide that they don't want to be in the Maryland Eastern Shore anymore, they want to move to Arkansas or wherever else, then Maryland loses a huge amount of tax money and a huge way of life on the Eastern Shore. And so I, that's, that's always been their reaction. The chicken company's reaction is, oh, you know, if it gets too expensive in Maryland, we'll do this in Arkansas or someplace else. It, you can see, like, you know, maybe morally it makes, it makes sense to do it. But politically, no one's ever been able to get close to doing it because of the threat of them moving out.
the arsenic that's in the feed, you follow this, this is, it's put into the feed for growth promoting. The chicken eats it, he poops it out. They come here, they distribute it, what he's eating. It's got arsenic in it. How much, I don't know. All the heavy metals goes into that chicken, goes out his rear end. But they put it back out on the field. Next year, they do the same thing. You understand what I'm saying? It's a comp composition. How much is in there, was in there 100 years ago as to now? Nobody has any records on it. They've only started keeping this stuff. I say we're all responsible because we eat the products that they produce. If we stopped eating chicken, there wouldn't be any more Purdue. But how many workers would be out of work? It's this delicate balance. I mean, I'm not a rocket scientist, but you don't have to be. You just put the numbers together to see that it affects everybody. And the watermen, what are there? I don't even think there's a 1,200 of them anymore in the state of Virginia. They're just aren't anymore. They just, you know, it's not worthwhile. Lots and times of a waterman. It's called the waterman on the checks. Okay. On the chest peak. I can't read too good. But what it is, it's just a a, a magazine. I mean, a book with just a, a a photographer just taking pictures. Can you still see this today? Is this? Do they do they bring them up like uh, that anymore? I, I don't even know if anybody crabs like this anymore. I really don't even think they crab like this anymore. Very good. I I gotta see something. I got to find out when this uh, book was uh, copyright 79. So I guess that's what they kind of did in this early 70s, because you figured 79, so it was probably done in the middle of 70s. But really, we don't even great, we don't even catch the crabs like we used to catch in 79.